The last chapter of our book focuses on conservation genetics. And what we really need to think about is how the human population has absolutely just exploded, particularly after the Industrial Revolution, but also after the development of antibiotics. And this explosion of the human population has had really adverse effects on the biodiversity of other species. Not only are wild species at risk, but recently the genetic diversity of domesticated plants and animals is also being lost, with about one third of them being at risk. When we're talking about genetic diversity, we're involving diversity between species as well as diversity within species. So even something as simple as, um, say, an apple. There are really, if you go to the grocery store, only a handful of different types of apples that are available for purchase. However, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of apples. The same is true for tomatoes. There's, you know, many, many different types of tomatoes, but really only just a handful of those are going to be available for commercial, commercial purchase. And so there are different things like gene banks that are going on. We'll talk more about them in this lecture. So humans have indirectly or directly accelerated the rate of species extinction. And we've done this through several different ways. First of all, directly through uh, hunting or harvesting of plants and animals, literally hunting them to extinction or killing them to extinction. The passenger pigeon is a pretty recent example of this. Um, passenger pigeons used to be thousands of them in the sky. Now they have gone extinct. There are just a few samples left and scientists are actually trying to use this to try to um, regrow the passenger pigeon. We'll see if they're, whether or not they're successful, whether or not it's a good idea to try to reintroduce these things once they've gone extinct. There are many habitat destruction, things like, you know, cutting down the rainforest and replacing it with farmland. By doing so, we're losing much of the biodiversity, some of which has not even yet been cataloged. And then lastly, through either deliberate or accidental introduction of invasive species. So things like in Australia, introducing rabbits. Okay, well, they didn't have any natural predators, and so now they've just gone wild, and they're everywhere, and they're eating a lot of the native vegetation. And they're crowding out, then, some of the native species that are there. So uh, we look, when we're looking at these, you have to think about the whole ecosystem, not just an individual species that's going extinct. Because there's a complex web of interdependent but diverse plants and animals that are tend to be found together in the same environment. So if you lose just one of those key sustaining species, that entire ecosystem might collapse. So the field of conservation genetics looks to, towards maintaining and restoring population viability of all different types of organisms. If you have very small populations, less than 100 of a different type of individual, they can quickly become vulnerable to genetic phenomena that increase the rate of extinction that we've talked about before. So things like genetic drift, just losing it by chance, the inbreeding or reduced gene flow in different ways. Um, they've done some studies in our book they talk about with bighorn sheep, and they've shown that populations of fewer than 50 are pretty likely to become extinct. That's just not enough to sustain the population. And so projections based on computer models show that for all species, if you have less than 100,000 of whatever type of organism you're talking about, likely going to be pretty limited when you're talking about adaptive genetic variation. And typically you're going to need at least 100,000 for a population to show this long-term sustainability. So, you know, if we were to ever, you know, do some space travel, colonize some other planets, we're going to need a pretty big starting population to prevent any problems happening from that, from that founder effect. Any populations that are smaller than that, these small isolated populations, they're going to be especially uh, sort of vulnerable to things like this genetic drift, the inbreeding, reduction in gene flow. Subsequently, they're going to suffer from reduced genetic diversity and this long-term species viability. So there's a couple of different ways that individuals are trying to maintain genetic diversity. And one of these ways is through ex situ conservation. What this involves is removing plants or animals from their original habitat to an artificially maintained location, possibly to form the basis for a captive breeding program. So things like zoos, botanical gardens, these would be examples of places where you can remove them from the original habitat, try to do this captive breeding program. Now the problem with both of these is it is a captive breeding program. 
And so what if the two individuals don't want to breed um, that you try to get to breed together uh, in the case of animals? Or in the case of plants, maybe there's some beneficial insects that are required for the reproduction process that might not be found in that particular botanical garden. And so although these programs can bring a species back from the brink of extinction, we're still going to lose some genetic diversity. There also may be some unintended selection for genotypes that happen to be more suited to these captive breeding programs. So one of the negatives of this is that it might reduce the capacity of that population once it recovers to adapt and survive in the wild. Um, for lack of a better term, they may be kind of domesticated, like dogs you know, formerly used to be wolves, and now they're domesticated and you leave a typical dog out in the wild, they may be able to survive, but not nearly as well as they can under our care. So some of the things we can do to prevent this, uh, maximizing genetic diversity by using the largest number possible of founding individuals. And so zoos will often swap individuals so that they can maintain this genetic diversity. Maximizing the total number of breeding pairs, minimizing the number of generations in captivity before we release back to the wild, and in avoiding inbreeding wherever possible. Gene banks are another form of this ex situ conservation. So these are going to be places where you literally take genetic samples of these different organisms and you save them, maybe freezer at minus 80 degrees Celsius. And these collections can then provide long-term storage of reproductive components of animals or plants. So there's a USDA facility in Colorado that saves many, many different types of seeds from all different types of organisms. So if there were some catastrophe to happen, we would have some backup supplies. So this approach has the disadvantage of loss of genetic variation just as before, as well as possible selective pressure. Maybe the preservation conditions are going to select for only, that can survive, only those organisms that can survive under those particular storage conditions and may not be as adapted to survive out in the wild. In situ conservation attempts uh, to preserve the population size and diversity of a species while it's being maintained on its own habitat, so in its own place where it's going to live. This also is going to help to maintain genetic diversity. The problem with this technique is that the habitats are getting smaller and smaller. More and more people are being born, we need more and more places to live, more and more places to grow our food. So the habitats, by necessity, are tend to be growing smaller and smaller. Uh, this is reducing gene flow, reducing migration, also may reduce this genetic diversity. Even by doing things like having a forest preserve, there's going to be sets of houses in between the forest preserve. So species may not want to leave their particular forest preserve to go down the street to the other one. And so there may be some interbreeding or inbreeding between populations that are staying within their own area. So taken together, restoring the most beneficial type and amount of this genetic diversity in a population is going to be a lot more complicated than we previously thought. We can't just save the seeds, we can't just save you know, DNA of these organisms to try to use them to repopulate later. So the best long-term strategy for, our, for all species survival is to prevent that loss of diversity from happening in the first place. So really fighting to try to maintain this habitat land trying to reduce the need for everybody to live a Western lifestyle where everybody has a house and two cars and a big backyard. So in conclusion, this week, make sure that you're posting in the discussion forums, make sure you're finishing up your homework from Mastering Genetics, make sure you take the quiz and continue to work on your student project. Please submit your student project before the end of the semester. The Dropbox is now open, so you could submit this at any time. You may, if you find a lot of this stuff interesting, you may want to check out, there's a great show on PBS that just finished airing called Your Inner Fish. It's a three-part series and it's all about evolution. And it talks a lot about how, how different genes are involved, uh, things like to develop the limb development, how the jaw bones have migrated to form the inner ear, you know, all sorts of things like that. The show Cosmos, which has been showing on Fox, is, you can also see old episodes on Hulu is also really fantastic. Um, they talk about all different aspects of science. There's a few episodes where they really focus on biology, it, both evolution and things at the molecular or atomic level. 
and many of it was focusing on you know physics or astrophysics and the stars and it's just all sorts of different topics and so I highly recommend that you check that out. Next week I will post your final exam. So this is going to be due via Dropbox by midnight on Friday, May 16th. This will give me time to grade it and input the grades which will be due on Monday. I really hope that you have enjoyed this semester and please let me know if you have any questions or any issues with anything as we're finishing up the semester.